to be in that space of letting it flow, you have to allow yourself into that space. There is hard work. I did 19 years of writing and then it seems like she wrote herself in three days. Yeah. But it was 19 years writing all of my emotion, my motherhood story, my ev- like everything out. At times, it was the hardest work I had ever done. I had done the hard yards my whole motherhood. And so it looked like within, you know, three months that I just popped this book out. It's the same with photography. You take photos every day, you refine your eye, you refine your voice. Like what captures your attention at 20 probably isn't going to catch your attention at 43. What's important to you, what your gaze is drawn to, the emotion, everything, that is the hard work. It's not just the settings and the, the type of camera you've got. The hard work is devoting, surrendering and going, I'm just going to play with it. I'm just going to explore it. And for humans, that's really hard because it may not have a purpose. You may take all these photos and as we've said, like maybe no one else is going to see them. But that, for the photographer, for the creative, for the mother, for the wife, for the, that can be the hardest work you've ever done. Some of those photos that we can't bear to look at. Like if we then have a photography business and we go and photograph mothers and families, we're giving them that. Yeah. We're giving them our experience of a really hard time. And we've worked on ourselves. Like, as we said, we're the ones going first. It's hard work. But I think to get to that place of where it flows, it's not going to flow all the time. I may never experience it again. I would love to, but I'm not going to put that pressure on myself. Help Me See is a podcast that redefines the word vision through vulnerable and real conversations, my own private introspective ramblings about the things that I think about in the wee hours of the morning, and my deep core belief that your nothingness is your everything, and all you have to do is see. I'm Bianca Mora, I'm your host, I am an educator, a photographic artist, and I believe that your daily photo habit can be the key to unlocking the ability to be more present in your everyday life and live deeper into your intention and purpose. We're not about the small talk here. Grab your coffee, get cozy, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Help Me See. Today, whew, today's an intense one. Heads up. <laughs> I absolutely loved this conversation. Um, I didn't cut a single minute of it. Uh, actually, I rarely ever cut anything, but <laughs> um, today on the show, we have Melinda Edwards and She is just a light in this world. Um, I feel like we talked for two seconds and it was two hours. And this is the first time we ever connected in person. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about her that she sent over, just so you have a little bit of an idea of her magic before we dive into the conversation that we had. So Melinda has created her business around experiences that bring her love, joy, curiosity, creativity, and connection. Photography, writing, and mentoring conversations are her spaces to explore with curiosity and creativity in a container for women clients entering into their own curiosity and openness to see themselves. She's created from a foundation of mothers and women having spaces to be, to be. And for her to study life, mothers, and what she offers the world with her own wisdom and knowledge. Her business and life is exactly how she creates it. And she is creating it one step at a time, understanding that as women, we have multiple facets to honor each one and to understand everything is reflected back. Everything. 
<sighs> I mean, I cried multiple times. I laughed. My mouth was open. Actually, what uh, uh, serendipitous in, in that regard is that I don't know if you are a listener who watches the videos on YouTube, but for some reason, it didn't go back and forth to her screen and my screen. And it's all just her. So sorry, Melinda, if that's disturbing to you, but <laughs> my screen never pops up. Um, I always hide my, the self view on my zoom because I never want to get distracted by my own face. And, um, it might show if there's some episodes where my hair is doing something insane and you're like, why doesn't she just fix that? It's because I never look at myself. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this conversation, um, really did something to my soul. And as soon as we were done talking, I just felt the biggest amount of like urgency of like, when will I talk to her again? It felt so good. Uh, we talk a lot about motherhood. We talk a lot about creating. Um, she's an author. We talk about how the book that she wrote just flowed out of her in like three days. Um, it's just an insane story. And I'm honored that she shared everything that she shared with us. It's really a really beautiful conversation. So we're just going to dive right in. Um, before we dive in, what did, what do I have to say? My, my heads up for our second ever photo yoga session is this Wednesday at noon Eastern time. Again, this is a free co-working space that is really flexible and open to anyone who wants to come and do some photo work. Um, ask questions. Maybe I'll be sharing my screen and editing, just making space for connection and actually doing the damn thing and editing those photos that you mean to edit, but never get to. <laughs> That's what I use the space for. Um, and then also before we head off, I will say, because this is the last Wednesday before next week, I am a speaker in this beautiful summit called the power of you summit. It is April 4th through 6th. And um, there's over 30 speaker presentations going on in that time. It's free. Uh, I will put the link in the show notes. So if you're interested um, and if you're on my email list, you'll get an email about this. I'll send a little bit more information there. Uh, and if you just want the link, go ahead and click the link in the show notes and you can learn more about how you can tune in and soak up uh, just <laughs> beautiful information from so many unique individuals all with the common goal of pointing you inward to your own um, brilliant wisdom. Okay, that is it. So now on to another brilliant individual, Melinda Edwards. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Um, and I'm giving you a virtual podcasting hug because... You might feel a little tender after this one, as I did. Enjoy. Okay. Hello. Hello. And welcome to another episode of Help Me See. Today I have Melinda Edwards on. And I don't even really know how to <laughs> tell the story of how I don't know how I came to find her. All I know is that I've been chomping at the bit to talk to her ever since I came across her work and her lovely self. Um, but there's been a lot of life in between then. But I'm so happy that we're here now and we were just getting started and don't know what the fuck to talk about. So <laughs> hello, Melinda. I think, I think because we're so we have so many things to talk about. I know. I know. Where do we start? What is okay. So I want to always allow for what is like most like tingly on top. So if there's something on top, let's just dive in and we'll get to other things eventually. But if not, I really want to hear about your book and how it came to be because you pulled a card before this conversation and it just like oozed out that experience that I, that I know of what I know of it. So what do you think? Anything else yeah. to talk about before we yeah. get on the book? No, let's do that. It's a very... You know, like you see these things on Instagram and you're like, oh, or social media or, you know, 
and you're like, oh, they've just done it really easy. Like it seems to have just come from nowhere. Um, yeah. Or, you know, like it's just <clears throat> you kind of compare and you're like, oh, <clears throat> you see these posts or stories and everyone's really excited and, you know, like they're like, look what I've done. And I was very much like that. And I actually had a few comments from authors that have like struggled and feel as though they've done the hard yards to like write their book. I had some quite nasty comments in my DMs about, well, look at you. You've written a book in no time. You <laughs> sold out 200 copies to, and you've got like 300 followers. Like, how did you do that? And, um, <laughs> I was in such a state of, you know what, I can't even actually describe it. The book herself, she created herself. So when I say I was on Instagram going, look what I've created, that was the stage that I was at because I hadn't created her, she literally came through me. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I have written a journal, a diary, scraps of paper, in anywhere I could find a blank page, I have written for ever. Like I remember writing in a journal when I was like six years old. And so I have journals in this office, like that cupboard has journals. Underneath that cupboard has journals. I have a bookshelf that has journals. Holy shit. That bookshelf has journals. Like they're everywhere. And there are also a lot that have ended up in the fire pile that I've burnt and I never want to see ever again. Um, so my motherhood journey is literally recorded, the good, the bad, the traumatic, everything in all of these journals. And on the 8th of July, 2021, I woke up and I, I can't describe the feeling. It was like, actually, it was like a craving. You know when you crave something in pregnancy? Mm-hmm. And you, and you have, have to, to have it. it. I risked my it. life for, a, for an orange juice one time, yeah. Literally. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there is, that, that you have to have it. That was that was me on the 8th of July. I had to come into my office and I pulled this office apart. It was like I was, it was kind of like I was manic. Mm-hmm. I just pulled all of these books out and I sat at this desk at this, like at this computer and I was going through these books and I had a blank screen up and I would read something and I would look up and the words would just flow out through my fingers. It was like I didn't need to even think about it. Um, and the, the words on the paper were nothing like what was coming out on the screen. It was like they were alchemizing as it was like coming through me. So I've had a very, both of my boys are very different. My first son he made himself known from conception. Like I swear I knew the moment I conceived that child mm. and then I was sick. He, we had a terrible pregnancy together. He wanted to come early. He was standing on his feet. He was born by cesarean section. Like he, the first 12 months, he was just like, this is me and you have to get to know me. Like he was very set in his ways, he was just like, I'm not changing for anybody. And he's 20 now, 21 in a few weeks. And I look back and I'm like, you have been, this is you, like you have been this way since conception. And then my other son, oh, my God, I didn't know I was pregnant. (laughs) Um, We had the easiest pregnancy. Like I literally sometimes would forget I was pregnant he slept from day one. We never had a sleepless night. He, I could literally, if we were going out, I could literally pick him up and he would, he would sleep. Like he was it, like, so easy. And so all of this is in all my journals. 
Mm. And so there's the struggles and there's the ease and there's the traumatizing parts and there's the celebration. And when Remember was coming through me, she literally came through in three days. The book was written in three days. Um, And it was so, it was such a state of just letting go and wasn't even letting go. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just writing. There was something else that was just flowing Mm. through. And then, yeah, like I kind of, when it was over, it was over. Like at the end of three days, I looked around and went, oh, God, I'm going to clean this mess up. (laughs) (laughs) And that was it. Like that's when I knew the writing had stopped. Mm -hmm. And I sat here and I was on Instagram and I was scrolling and I saw this lady dancing in this beautiful white dress. Anyway, I clicked on it to see where she got the dress. And she's an Australian author who had just published her book and she was dancing at her book launch. And she had a list of the people that had helped her with her book, like a list of credits. So I clicked on um, her graphic designer because I went through and had a look at her book and I'm like, oh, that is such a beautiful book. Anyway, I sent Indy a message. I'm like, hi, I think I've just written a book. You don't know me, but I've just found your name and I think I've just written a book and wondering if you can help me. And she, I think she'd been like off or she was on holidays or something, but she, she messaged straight back. And she's like, I've just looked at my phone as like an off, like an off chance that I would look at it. And our relationship started like that day. And remember came out in September. It was the process of how she was written to how she arrived at people's homes was flawless. Every single step, every single process, you know, as soon as, like I knew nothing, nothing of self-publishing a book. Like it had never been a dream. It had never been a thought in my head. I never inquired to the process. I had no idea. And every single step was done with ease and grace and beauty and everything just, Indy was like, okay, so what do you want your book to look like? And as soon as she said it, I'm like, it has to be, you know, this size. So I want it to be like a companion to fit it in a mother's purse. I want it to be, you know, like, and I'm like, where is, I don't even know where this is coming from. Like, and everything I was saying was just like, Blowing. You're like, a, like I want it to be a good kind of possessed. <laughs> literally, literally. And then I was like, oh, I kind of know that yellow means remember. And she's like, okay. And she's like, what do you even want to call the book? And I'm like, oh. And it was like I didn't even have to think about the name. I was like, oh, it's haven't we didn't we think about that? It's called Remember. It's the best like, book title ever. Like ever. And she's like, We've never spoken about that. I'm like, oh. And it was like nothing had to be thought about. It was like it was already, it already was. And then so I sent her the copy and we went through and we decided on exactly how she would look and feel. And I sent, you know, her all the words and then she sent me back just her work and the way she, you know, laid the words out and just the way she designed the book. I mean, you could just tell from the cover. You, I I never even saw the inside. You could tell from the cover how gorgeous it is. I have to like, yeah, like she just, so when I got the first unbound copy, which is still my absolute favorite, like it's, it's still my absolute favorite. It's unbound. It's all loose. Mm. And, you know, just 
the way. And I would be framing every single one of those and hanging on. Well, a- I'm actually doing, <laughs> I'm, I actually will be at the end of the year, um, Indy and I are going to do a print run of the pages and we're organizing it at the, at, as we speak. Wait a minute. Um, what do you mean to like sell it, like selling them like prints? Yeah, yeah. So it won't be a book. It'll be the prints. Oh my God. I'm yeah. so excited. Oh my yeah. God. The, the font choice too is beautiful. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Oh my and God. so she just, she just came through and there was no decisions. Like there was no, I literally didn't have to make decisions. And then we, when we went to printing, Indy's like, oh, there's this printer I want you to use. They're high-end, they're beautiful, the work is stunning, da da da. I'm like, okay, yep, cool. And so she's like, but they have like their wait list is months. Like it'll be months. She's like, let me get a quote, like we'll see how we go. I said, okay. And she's like, I've got a couple of others we can go through. I was like, okay. Anyway, she got on to the her favorite one. And they're like, oh, actually, we've like had an opening. We can like do it next week. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. 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 And I'm just like, oh my God. Because Indy was, she was very, like, she walked me through the whole process. She was like, you know, it's going to take a few months. It actually didn't. From writing to it being put in the post was July to September. Have and you it was read Deepak Chopra's The Spontaneous Fulfillment of Desire. No. Talk about synchro destiny. This is like as you're talking, it's just like slapping me in the forehead because I just read it. So maybe, maybe take a look at some point. But it just mm. sounds like I mean, okay. I have so many questions, but please continue. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. You. And it was just the same, you know, like posting it in Australia at the time, nightmare. It my book arrived within no time at all. Like they were like, your delivery is on the way. A day later it was here. Like that was just unheard of in Australia at that time. Um, I had like 300 followers on Instagram. I sold 200 books. Um, she went international straight away. Like I was, I sent, I think more copies internationally, like US, France, New Zealand, Canada, um, than I did in Australia. Um, and when I was, when I was at the post office sending her, it just felt like she was in the right hands. Like it just, it was almost like she picked the women because I only did a, sh- a small run, so it was 250. And it just, even sending her, it just felt like the right women were receiving her. Mm. Mm. It was incredible and what's the response been have you heard yeah I got feedback straight away um she's been called an oracle Mm. um there has been uh, endless tears in my like dms and video messages um of just women going it doesn't matter what page I open, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I see myself or I recognize where I am at the moment or it was just what I needed to hear today. And that was so important to me. And it wasn't even like I was thinking about it when I was writing it because I felt like I had I was just the conduit that she came through. Um and I think the potency came from um, the journals and the depths of my despair in some of those journals. And the journals were never, ever to see the light of day. Like no one was to ever read those journals. There was, you know, like we went through a really hard time with my eldest son from 14 to 18. There was drugs, there was running away, there was, you know, like just we lost family, we lost friends because, you know, just judgment and people just are like, how have you raised your child like this, you know? 
And we were like, it was just the most terrible. Um, it was the most terrible time. It was the most I've learned ever as myself. Um, in those depths of, you know, he would he would ring me at midnight and say, Can you come pick me up? And I didn't even know he wasn't here. Or, you know, the the highest thing that I wanted for my children was education. And so, you know, we we put them in very good schools. He got kicked out. Um it was just this constant I have to love this child no matter what it actually mm. it's his this is his life he is learning I am learning he chose me as his mum for a reason and we just have to get through it mm. and you know like now he looks back and he's like, that was, that's just our story. Like, he's like, I, I had to do that for a reason. And he's like, now he's completely sober. He doesn't touch alcohol at all. He's completely focused. He knows what he wants in life. He has, yeah, like he's just this kind-hearted and he was always kind-hearted that's the thing like you see kids going through this really hard time and you're like this isn't you and I think that's what what almost got me through on some days is like I know this isn't his heart and soul and I know at some point there has to be some point that that boy understands that and there has to be some point that his heart and soul kicks in and is like, that's enough, mate. You've caused enough trauma. Um, and that's that's literally how it happened. He had a motorbike accident that nearly killed him. Um, again, we got a phone call from the hospital to say, your son is in hospital, he's unconscious, um, you need to come. And he was on drugs and we went and then the hardest 12 months of our life after that because I was afraid that the drugs would get worse because he was in so much pain because he had broken bones, he had no skin down the left side of his body, he was had a head injury. And it was actually that accident um, that turned him inward to his own heart. Mm. Yeah. And all of that was in these journals. Like it was a lot deeper than that, but that story was in these journals. Um, and as I said, like, as I was reading to like nearly two years on from when I'd written it and some of them, you know, had gone back to when the boys were little, but it was, it was just alchemizing and healing for me mm. as it was coming through. Um, and even now, like I read some of the pages and I remember the page in the journal that that came from mm. and it, it kind of awes me that that level of pain can cause that amount of beauty or reflection or, you know, just to be able to read the words that come from that in a completely opposite way. So I know you said when you were kind of like, looking at the journal pages and then writing, you weren't, it was just alchemizing. You weren't even trying to put it through a filter. Is that what you're saying happened? Like from whatever you read, whatever you wrote ended up being more, more what? Like, how would you describe it? So let me read. 
So I don't know. Can you see that? No. Cheer loudly, cheer loudly for your friends, support their dreams, listen to their hearts. Mm-hmm. During this time, that was all I wanted, but I didn't know that. I was so, so far in depression and fight or flight, survival mode. I unknowingly or unconsciously, I suppose, had pushed every had pushed everyone away. I didn't know that I needed friends. I didn't know I needed people to cheer me on. I didn't know <laughs> I needed people to listen to my dreams. Even if it was the dream of having a healthy child. Like I didn't know I needed that. I felt I needed to do you did actually you did a podcast on speaking from your wounds. I I that floored me because I cannot advocate for that any higher. Like mm. not everyone needs to know your story. Not everyone needs to know you from that wound Mm. but you need someone Mm. if it's one person that is there while you're hemorrhaging from that wound Mm -hmm. don't wait for it to scab over Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have to you know when when you when you say speak to me it doesn't have to be to thousands of people on social media yeah it can just be one person. I, that's that's something that I talk about when I when I talk about photographic practice and how sometimes people well why would I want a picture of that like or where would I I would never want it. this is not every picture you take is not for print every picture you take is not for social media no. every picture you take is not for your child no. it is a medium in which you are able to access your subcon it is the only way that you can see what you see. Yes. If you yes. look at your photo scroll and just imagine yourself zoom back, fly yeah. up out of the room and look at it again. Yeah. Yeah. It is what I call the way of bringing your 2020 hindsight like closest to you now as possible. That is what it is. And what you're saying is speaking from that fleshiness and that I feel like is so Uh, it's like so inadvertently shamed through that fucking quote that I can't stand that I understand cognitively at multiple levels, the share share from the wound. Mm. But I mean, it is such a specific, um, specific use case that that is relevant. If you're holding space for someone in a circle, if you're holding space for someone in a therapy session, yeah. Yeah. Like to make, anyone feel as though that sharing before it's all tidy and they're healed and it's better I, how would it ever get better no wonder yeah. you have an outpouring of like people are so thirsty for like realness and what is that but I yeah and yeah I just I on some level creatively I don't know during this time I did some self-portraits and they weren't even self-portraits at the time it was like I had to like you said it's like no one else was going to see these photos Mm -hmm. I felt like no one was seeing me at the time I felt so lonely I felt so like I can't even you know like there was just there was nothing there was I I felt like I could not speak and on some level inside of me, I needed to be recognized. So I did, I took self portraits and there's some I literally can't look at now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are so painful. They are so painful. And at the time my son didn't want to be photographed at all um, during those sort of four years. And they, like the photos I did take of him, I had to be very sort of ninja-like about it and they will never see the light of day. Um, 
because he did not consent to me taking those photos. So, you know, um, and even then, and it's terrible to say about your child, I actually don't like the photos of him of that time. Mm-hmm. It does not look like him. His eyes are dead. He's just, you know, when you take a photo and you literally, they're so powerful that you capture that essence of a person. Mm-hmm. Like people, you know, you can click on your phone and take a photo. But when you are like in it, when you're in it and you take a photo and it is the essence of that person mm-hmm. and you just have to look at that and you're like, oh, I know that. I know that person. Mm-hmm. Like I I feel like I know that person, even if you don't know them. Mm-hmm. That was these photos. There was so much pain, so much anger, just the emotion in these photos. And it was just, they were dark photos. And I'm like, I actually never want to see my that version of my child. But what is it? I totally hear and I have... Ha- empathize and I've had experiences where I take photos that I never even want to look at there's some photos that I've taken that like even when I'm scrolling to look at an old photo like and I know it's like coming in that time I'll like close my eyes like that amount yeah Yeah. but like what does it feel like for you to know they exist you know what I mean that and that's the power of photography Mm -hmm. I'm grateful they exist that will never be deleted. That will always be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though I don't want to look at that version of my child and it's painful, and even now when I look at it, the feelings of that time literally come rushing back. Mm-hmm. However, I feel very privileged to know my child to that depth Hmm. oh my god sorry (laughs) that hit me really hard (laughs) oh man no it's so beautiful and it's just so freaking weird that this is the conversation we find ourselves in when this was not planned at all because (laughs) Just today, I mean, I had a morning. I mean, it obviously it does nothing compares to what you're talking about right now, but I have a four year old and a two year old. My four year old is having like, you know, their stupid stuff at school and where there's like saying he's below average, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, so I was talking to my girlfriend about like how I think I need to find a new space for him, like an alternative, whatever. I just. Oh my God, don't get me started on that because I'll talk to you for. Oh, I I know. I was just saying like, there's stuff on the sheet where I'm like, I see him do this all the time. If he's not feeling comfortable to do that here, this is not the space for him and we're, whatever we're, so we're talking and it's just so funny. Cause my, you said your boys are opposite. My boys are so opposite. Like my <laughs> two-year-old is like the most easygoing savage. She's like sick. He's like seventh percentile. He's like this little leprechaun, but he thinks he's 12 feet tall. My oldest one, the four-year-old, is like the most sensitive soul. Yep. He lays his head on my chest. Goes, mommy, I will always love you, mommy. I'm like, where am I going? You're freaking me out. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, but I was talking to my friend who also has a son. And we were talking about how, okay, she, and she's about to have a daughter now. And I was like, yeah, you know, I used to think before I, and I was reading about before I was a mom, what it was like to have like a boy versus girl and whatever. I watched way too many Gilmore girls episodes uh, (laughs) in my day, but uh, I was like, I always thought it was kind of weird when they said like, Oh, a mother and her son, a mother and her son. It's like, but now I kind of, I, I get it, even though I don't have a daughter because from, from what I can tell like so far because even when I see them at this age like this young out in the world and the way they are with literally everyone else and then with me it's just so different and I just feel like a mother like sees like straight into her son's soul yep. it's just like Absolutely. and no matter what no matter what beautiful wife no matter what beautiful relationships they have in their life 
there is always something else, this something else that comes before that they want to uh, protect or serve or you know pr- provide for someone else like there's always that filter no matter what but not with mom mm-hmm. and i just think that what you just said is like so true like the beautiful thing is like you turn that around and like you're like yeah and i i got to know him and he knows and like he it sounds like he has that knowing too he does he and has- i think like exactly what you just said your first boy is very sensitive so jack is beyond like he is so sensitive so sensitive that he actually comes off as quite harsh sometimes um whereas tom is very easy go lucky he's like the class clown he's you know like (laughs) but his sensitivity comes through in extreme protectiveness towards me Mm. he's very thoughtful he's very like you know like he he's the first one to say to me how was your day did you have a good day like how old is he He's 17. He's 17. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. And, you know, like, and getting back to the school thing. So my boys went to Montessori. That's what I'm looking into right now. I don't know. I will forever advocate for that. Okay. It lets their it lets their personality come out. Mm. So my boys are opposites. They learn opposites. Montessori embrace that. We did try a conventional school for Jack um, from prep to grade two. It broke his spirit. Um, you know, he was he was distraction. He talked too much. He was causing trouble. He was bored. You know, uh, every day I was getting notes or getting called into the classroom. I'm like, he is bored. Because he's done all the work. Mm-hmm. He is like this. He's so sensitive. He needs to move. He needs to be engaged. He needs to explore. Like, and Montessori allowed that to a depth that I'm so grateful for because as soon as he got into that environment, he thrived. Mm-hmm. And the same with Tom. He's not a book learner. He needs to use his hands to learn. And Montessori allowed that. And again, he thrived. You know, um, and that I think as a mother to be able to recognize how our children need to be every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just sending them to school and going, you'll be right. Mm -hmm. Because they're there for so long. It's so pivotal. It's so influential like the power of the people that they're around all the time was really important to me um I did not want people telling my child you know like I'm for like you know I'm for you know pulling them up on things and you know like if they're doing the wrong thing of course you know having a chat about it but for someone to be just constantly in his face going, you're such a naughty boy. Mm. And he wasn't a naughty boy. He was he was bored out of his brain. He was too advanced for the work that he was doing. Mm. You know, like he and they couldn't see that. They couldn't they couldn't read his personality. They couldn't understand that he wanted more. Just like he was he was a sponge that wanted to be filled up. He didn't yeah. want to sit and just be passive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very grateful that I stood my ground and and I'm grateful that I knew knew my kids that well. Um, and it's definitely to build that trust in your kid and for them to know that their mum has their back in that way and it will fight for them and, you know, not just put up with you know right. anything right. and will advocate for them and supports them and it builds a level of trust that when we were going through all that with Jack 
he knew no matter where he was, no matter what, what he'd taken, who he was with, he could ring me and I would go and pick him up. Mm-hmm. He knew that he could always come home and he knew that we were a safe space. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you were talking about, like the kids act differently when they're with others. Mm-hmm. Absolutely they do because they come home and we are their safe space. Mm-hmm. Like Which isn't safe- always fun. It's not always fun. It is hard. Mm-hmm. It is hard. And there's a page in the book that was it says, you are your child's first home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like a mother is their child's first home. Like they always will, you know, they they want to come back to us mm-hmm. and not necessarily the house. Yeah. But it's, you know, like my boys still, even like, you know, if I'm not home, they'll be texting me going, where are you? I'm You're just like, I have a life. <laughs> <laughs> they're 20 and 17 and they're like, I want to see you. Where are you? Oh my God. That is like <laughs> music to my ears. I can't even tell you. You know, it's funny. It's, this is making me think um, a while ago, I was on um, someone else's podcast. Um, it was the art of being a mom. And she had asked me what, I forget what she even asked me, but what came out was that I didn't realize was there, or I'd never at least said it um, out loud, was that like the most important thing to me in my motherhood, like in my relationship with my sons, is is this reciprocal feeling of like, to know all of, uh, like for them to know all of me, like to not... Yeah. To not feel like they grew when they grow up, they start realizing things that they never knew, or like for yeah. me to like hide all the bad stuff, like you know. And I never thought of it that way before until I said it then. And I'm like, yes, yeah. it is yeah. so important to me that like they are never surprised yeah. by something yeah. they learn about me. There's literally a page in my book that says, you know, women are multifaceted; not all um, sides of us are fine shot shine bright 100% of the time and that is exactly where that came from I want my kids to see my laughter to see my tears I want them to know you know I'm a mom I'm a wife that desperately loves my husband you know I'm a sister and they see me with my sisters they see me you know with my girlfriends like I have such a beautiful tight knit group of women that I just adore and love and my boys have known them forever and they see how I am with my girlfriends and you know like I work you know at an emergency department and they see me as the woman that goes and works in an emergency department or you know Mm -hmm. does shift work they're forever seeing me you know with my camera they were very much part of writing or you know creating remember like they knew uh, the day I wrote it, I was like, we're sitting at the table. We always, no matter what, we always have dinner together at the end of the day. No phones, just we all, there's no phones allowed. We all sit and we all have dinner together. And I was like, I think I wrote a book. And they're like, what? What do you mean you think you wrote a book? How can you think you wrote a book? And I was like telling them about it. <laughs> You're like, and it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, I was literally like, and they know like, <laughs> they've seen me writing my journals they know that there's journals yeah. here and if they want to read it like of course. Oh, go ahead um yeah like they they've <laughs> seen me publish a book like they were at home we picked him up from school and he was there when I was posting the books internationally like he was standing behind me and the lady's like this is really cool he's like yeah that's my mom oh but <laughs> you know like they're the things, you know, they've seen me cry when in deep grief, you know, I didn't hide my anger and my frustration and my tears when we were going through all this with Jack. Mm -hmm. And then they've also seen me, you know, like the the mom on the sidelines at cricket or football and I'm (laughs) cheering and I'm like the loudest one and I'm like, you know, security is coming up going, you can't keep yelling. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) You know, like my boys have like, and that's what I love about our relationship. Yeah. They, that's exactly right. I never, if I died today, 
I want my boys to know they knew me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it's you know, only natural that 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 is mirrored, and that they're not afraid to show yeah. you any part of them. Exactly, exactly, and you know. When you've got that reflection back, that's another page in my book, everything is reflected back, everything. Um, When you've got that reflection of honesty and truth coming back, the depth of your relationship with your kids is so cool. Like as they're getting older, like I keep reading these things of like, oh, you only have your kids for 18 summers. No, you don't. Your kids aren't going anywhere. If you've got that relationship, of openness and honesty and fun and they know they can cry like I've had you know like Jack had his heart absolutely broken by a girl I was the first one he rang Mm -hmm. you know like he cried the whole way home he literally you know like I keep seeing these photos of you know toddlers and it's like oh this will be the you know what if this is the last time I pick my child up please I literally sat on the lounge and I had my child in my arms after a girl had broken his heart at like 19. Oh. (laughs) They will, if you've got that just openness and you have to let them see you so that they feel safe for themselves to show you. Yeah, you must go first. You have to go first. But you're the example. Mm -hmm. You are the example. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a reciprocal thing, like you said. Like, they have to see you lead. Mm -hmm. That's so funny. The other day, I don't even know where I was or who I was talking to, what venue it was at, but I think it was maybe, I don't know, um, talking about that mirroring and just you must go first. And it's like, in a session when you're like, well, how do you get someone to be natural? It's like, by not being like, oh, just be natural, yep. just relax. Just you relax. Yep. It, it happens. Yep. It, the best way to get whatever result you want is to ignore the result and be the thing. That's it. Yes. I know it's yep. maddening. It's so fucking annoying to hear, especially when you're not in a place to receive it. But like, it is true. <laughs> and that's the thing. Receive it. Yeah. Even if it's one breath at a time. Yeah. And oftentimes it has to be one breath at a time because it's too big, not too like too big. It's like me uh, every day now. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get on that treadmill every day. I'm like, I want (laughs) to fucking get on the treadmill. I need to go outside for a walk is what I need to do. But I'm so extreme. I'm like, no, if I'm going to work out, it's going to be effective. I'm like, well, you know what's not effective? Sitting right here every single day that I, (laughs) yeah. So it's like these, the the little steps when something, it feels too big or like, yeah. Oh my goodness. It has to be. It has to be one step at a time. I have a question. I have yes, a question. Sorry. So, well, I have two questions, but um, one was there when you said you woke up and it just flowed through you like a craving, pregnancy craving. Was there anything in particular that was building before that or no? And then my part two to that question, like, is there anything, like, did you feel an itch coming on or was it literally clear out of, out of nowhere you woke up and there it was. And then yeah. the second part of the question is after having such a like spiritual experience in this creative act, have you experienced something like that again? And what does it feel like now? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the lead up to that so the lead up to um, writing her, I'd actually stopped writing in my journal. What? After mm. all those years? Why mm. do you think? I. It's not that I had. So I go through these like sometimes I'll write every single day for, you know, I don't know, whatever, years, yeah. months. Mm-hmm. And then some day, sometimes I won't write for like a couple of months. Right, right, right. Before that. I hadn't been writing in my journal. That's how I am with my photography, like my, with my camera, with my yeah. cell phone all the time. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
and I hadn't, I just hadn't been writing. And quite quite often, if I haven't written for a long time, um, I do get a bit of a craving of like, oh, I need like I need to sit and write. Mm-hmm. And I'm a trained typist, so for me, usually the start of that is me just sitting at the computer, closing my eyes, and I just type. And my fingers can fly across those keyboards, and I just it's so therapeutic and so just getting stuff out I never say that I just click the x and it's gone like gone and oh my gosh I <laughs> my whole inside just clenched why why don't you save it <laughs> um, usually when I'm in that state it's a release mm-hmm. like I don't need to I don't need to process or it read it again or mm-hmm. It just flows out of me and I'm like, good with it. It just comes out and it's kind of gone. Um, and so, yeah, like, so for me, writing and photography are very, oh, they're just, they're like my feelers. Like writing sometimes can feel too big. It feels too expansive. There's too much paper. There's too much white space. There's too many words. There's too many thoughts. There's, it's, too big and so then I I like my camera and looking through that lens and being in the moment and just focusing on what is exactly right in front of me Mm. is what I need brings Mm. me back to my center it's like this is what is in front of my face right now it's oftentimes the only way I can it's just having that square force me is the only way because I'm like Yes. I really resonate with the word manic. Oftentimes I feel manic and like that mm-hmm. helps. Yep. And it does. It's just like, do you combine, do you combine pictures and writing? It's one of my favorites. I never have, but oh you know God. what? I, I almost have this same craving again <laughs> of telling, telling a story with both. Cause I've always had this thing of like, it needs to be one or the other. I want to be able to tell a story with words or I want to be able to tell a story just with picture. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, like the last, I don't know, few months, I've really got this like, oh. Percolating. Combined. Yeah. I started writing, I started writing a book without ever having to with ever having to want without ever having to have wanted to do that. Yeah. And I started in a way that felt like, oh yeah. And then it really like I think there was like I tried forcing something. And then I stopped and I'm like, this book doesn't the book I'm writing isn't doesn't have pictures. That's not me. Like <laughs> like what am I doing? And I'm like, I'm yeah. putting a format on something that is not what am I doing? And then so I stopped and now I'm like back, like reflecting on, you know, what, even what pictures I would use, but like, yeah, I just, I don't know. It's so funny because I'm someone who loves like learn. I'm a forever learner. I am always oh, in a course. I am always in a book with like a highlighter in hand. Like my happy place is like, I don't even like anything to do with like drinking and information. Oh, me too. Oh my gosh. But <laughs> I, I will say that like the most right things are the least amount of effort. There isn't yes. an efforting and it's what you're talking about. It's just, and it it's, I guess it does sound infuriating, right? Because there's hard work. So yes. it does sound infuriating for some to just come through, but like, I mean, I would hope that it's not a triggering thing. I would hope that that's something to be like, it's like a marriage. And I think you need to to be in that space of letting it flow and just that, exactly what you're talking about. You almost, like you have to, you have to allow yourself into that space. Mm-hmm. You have to have the confidence. Like there is hard work. Like, I did 19 years of writing. Yeah. 
And then she wrote, like, it seems like she wrote herself in three days. Yeah. But it was 19 years in the making. Of writing all of my emotion, my motherhood story, my, ev- like, everything out mm-hmm. in such a way that at times it was the hardest work I had ever done. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I was like getting a few little DMs and things going, oh, look at you, you've written a book in three days. I had done the hard yards mm-hmm. my whole motherhood. Mm-hmm. And so it looked like within, you know, three months that I just popped this book out. And I think it's the same, it's the same with photography. You take photos every day, you refine your eye, you refine your voice. Like what captures your attention at 20 probably isn't going to catch your attention at 43. What's important to you, what your gaze is drawn to, the emotion, the, you know, like everything, that is the hard work. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not just the settings and the, the type of camera you've got. The hard work is devoting, surrendering, and going. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play with it. I'm just gonna explore it. And for humans, that's really hard because it may not have a purpose. You may take all these oh. photos, mm-hmm. and as we've said, like maybe no one else is gonna see them. Mm-hmm. But that. For the photographer, for the creative, for the mother, for the wife, for the that that can be the hardest work you've ever done. Some of those photos that we can't bear to look at. Like if we then have a photography business and we go and photograph mothers and families, we're giving them that. Yeah. We're giving them our experience of a really hard time. And we've worked on ourselves. Like, as we said, we're the ones going first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like it's hard work but I think to get to that place of where it flows it's not going to flow all the time I may never experience it again because it was such a big thing for me to experience I would love to I would love to get to that point in my photography mm-hmm. but I'm not going to put that pressure on myself mm-hmm. like we everything is so abundant and beautiful and creative and I think if we can just take a breath and you know just let go sometimes we just need to just be in it like be in it in it it's the hardest work of my life I grew up with um I, my parents, I love them dearly. They love me dear, dearly. But my father, who I am his child through and through, he is like a very, very like worrisome, overprotective, um, yeah. like New York Italian. Like, so I mean, to this day, I have to text him when I get somewhere. And oh, like, oh, oh, I was on at, at a retreat out of town. And he would text me, okay, I just need to, this one little thing will give you the scope of the intensity of this man. <laughs> he would text me and ask, are you good? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And then he'd say, what was your first, um, what was, what was our first dog's name? And I'm like, are you, what? What are you talking about? <gasps> it didn't hit me until hours. I was like, are you checking to make sure that a, a, a kidnapper <laughs> doesn't have my cell phone <laughs> responding on my behalf? I'm like oh my god I'm like dad you need to get help. oh you dad <laughs> but but anyway so that is that's scene set that is where I come from <laughs> and <laughs> so like this idea of like just being open to receive I struggle with it uh in a way of like I've always equated things that I love with like pain like I like an ache like yep. I could just my first dog 
that passed away two years ago now, I remember, um, so I had him before I had kids. I would look at him and just sleeping on the floor, just being a dog. And I would feel like someone had my heart and was like squeezing the ever love and life out of it. And it's just, when I see things that I love, it hurts. And so this idea of having your hands open and as a mother to two young boys, I often say it's not for the faint of heart and I am faint of heart. Like it's hard. And I am so emotional today. Just really hard. And but the most you'll faint heart. Yes. You have you can't harden yourself to it. But like it's it's (laughs) the art, like the exchange of the like in the medium of photography, it is the only thing that keeps me grounded in that. Like, I know that to be true. If I didn't have my camera, I could know that intellectually, but I wouldn't, I would ignore it. I would not like that tie to that is the only thing in my whole life that gives me the knowing that like, no, this is true. I know every cell in your body feels yeah. like no you must hold on and you must yeah. fear this and fear that but my experiences with complete strangers with my camera yeah. with my kids with my camera it it shows me every single time if you just open and let it be like people that are like oh my you know my kids don't last for more than 20 minutes so I like I'm like I don't I don't do many sessions because like I promise you just let them lead. I'm just, I'm going to be in your life. You're not coming to a photo shoot. I'm just going to come to your life. And then that's it. Yeah. And it's always perfect. No matter what, even there's always, I think that's our thing. You know, we're not. So, you know, you can, yeah, your kid might last 20 minutes. Let them get past that 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. What happens past that? What's the depth of that? What's the pushing of boundaries? What's the comfort? What's the, they get to, you know, what, how will they get to know you after that 20 minutes? You know, like, I think we're very, social media doesn't help. Mm. It has to be quick. It has to be the 20 minutes. It's got to be done in, you know, you've got to catch the essence of that person in like Mm. 20 shots or whatever. But it's literally, it's our love letter Mm -hmm. kind of to ourselves because we have this need to translate life and humans and, you know, I think creators are deeply, deeply searching and curious just about that life essence and how to get to it and. You know, just that, just the capture of life. Yeah, like what, what, when you're saying what happens after that 20 minutes and like, do you know what you look like in those 20 minutes of that meltdown? Like, yeah, what a gift to, you don't know, like how many times are, is your child in your arms sobbing and you're comforting them and you don't even know how beautiful that looks. You have no idea. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. Okay. Perfect time to bring this up. I need you to say more about your long portrait idea. (laughs) Uh, It made me think, I don't, I just need to hear more on that. In college, um, I was doing a, I was in a conceptual practices class and I came to the weird thought of like how I don't know what I look like from the back. (laughs) Like, I'm like, that's just so weird. I don't even know people, strangers know what I look like more than I look, whatever. So I had, um, done a series where I would set my camera up and I would give like someone I was close with like the trigger and we would just be having a conversation and I'd let them they tell you this that's so cool oh I didn't so I would have them um as we're talking just like take pictures and it was just random like I, I mean just me like in sitting in a lab me like laying in bed like whatever and one, I, I did never knew how animated I was speaking because when do you speak to yourself in a mirror? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. never, there were things about me that I'm like, 
that's what I look like, you know? I love that. So it was so strange, but like, it's just like, and the pictures are nothing to write home about by any means, but like, it's just so interesting. And like, that's like another sliver of experience that I like keep in here too. It's just like knowing that someone has no idea. You have no idea. So can you talk a little bit about your long portrait? Yeah. So it was kind of similar because I was, I'm just very in this, I just want to be uncomfortable at the moment, but like a good uncomfortable. And it's exactly like you're just saying, like, I don't know, like, I don't know what I look like at the back. And I sometimes think of that. I'm like, God, what does my hair look like at the back? Because it's like curly at the front. Does it look like a birthday at the back? Um, <laughs> and so a mentoring client, she, I don't know how, she was talking about it and she's like, oh, like, uh, I think she's in like a loop or something. And she's like, oh, they were talking about these um, long portraits. And I'm like, oh, it's a long portrait. And she's like, it's, um, you know, you set yourself up in front of the camera and you have to sit there for two minutes. And I'm like, God, that sounds terrible. And she's like, I know, doesn't it? Anyway, she didn't do it. And she's like, no one's like signed, like no one did the activity. And she's like, everyone found it too confronting and too, um, you know, like really uncomfortable. And I'm like, I can't believe no one did it. And she's like, oh, yeah. Anyway, I was like trying to just, you know, like it feels like an echo chamber on Instagram sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I'd started a post. I'm like, hi, I'm Melinda, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just the usual. I'm a mom, you know, whatever. And I thought this, what's like, there's literally no point to this post. People are so bored of seeing this type of post. People do not care about this type of post. How can I push it a little bit? How can I make it creative, make it interesting? How can I make myself a little bit uncomfortable? How can I kind of go first, I suppose? Mm. And then I started thinking about this long portrait. So I set up my camera and I'm like, I sort of set myself boundaries because I thought it has to be one take or I'm just going to sit there all day until yeah. I like it's perfect. And I had to go out somewhere and I thought, you know what, now is the perfect time to do it because if I do it now, I'll have enough time to just like get ready and go. Anyway, I did it. I sat there and I was just like, it's so ridiculous. There was no one else home but me and the dog and I'd set my camera up. I could feel shame. I could feel embarrassment. I could feel comparison I could feel I'm like god like am am I smiling right it's like literally what do I look like and then I'm like I felt so uncomfortable in my body and I could the first few minutes like seconds I'm just like moving and I'm like did you do it with your phone or with your I did it with my phone because I thought if I take the time to set up my camera Mm -hmm. I'm just going to talk myself out of it yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like moving and I literally felt this just nervous, uncomfortable energy. It was so, I'm so glad I did it. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of passed. And then I started like almost giggling because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> why are you feeling these, these feelings? Like, get over yourself, love. You know, like it's a photo, it's a portrait. And And then I kind of settled into it and I'm thinking, oh, well, like, whatever. And then by the end and the timer went off, I was a bit disappointed because I was like, oh, I wonder what would have happened, like what would have come out or how I would have settled into my body and into like my emotion of being, feeling this exposed if it was like five minutes. You should do a 10 minute one. Yeah, it was so... It was confronting and uncomfortable and I'm glad I did it because I did not I did not expect to feel shame or embarrassment. It was just I expected to feel nervous 
because mm. I was like, ooh, like this is going to go on Instagram. But that, like I was nervous, of course, but I didn't expect the depth of what I actually felt at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and two, I am very uncomfortable with how I speak and like listening to my own voice. And so narrating over the top of that was a highly uncomfortable experience. You're like, let's just round it out. Let's just <laughs> let's go all in. We're here. Literally, literally, I'm here. This is me. And next time I'll do it in my underwear. <laughs> yeah, God. You know, I think it would have been less, I think it would have been less confronting. I don't know. Oh. It was just, but I'm glad that I did it. And I'm glad that I got so uncomfortable. And even now I I like listen up and I kind of shudder a little bit. But I don't know. I'm like, I survived. Now I'm like, it's done. I survived. It's no big deal. So beautiful. It's making me think of um um my coach, uh, she's actually in Australia, Haley Carr. Yes. She has this thing called the Pizza Challenge that I oh. did um in the front end of a of a coaching container I did with her. You have to go if you choose to accept a challenge, like a mad person, you go <laughs> into somewhere and ask for a pizza that is not a pizza place. <laughs> I can't even tell you. I can't even tell you the pins and needles and the pricks from my scalp to my toes. Melinda, like I went into, I don't know if you know what a men's warehouse is, but it's basically like a suit shop. Like, <laughs> I, what was the response? What did they say? <laughs> I'm honestly like getting, did you even get it out? Like, how did you start the conversation? Getting sweaty armpits, just talking to you. So I kind of did it the way you did it in that it's so funny. I was, I didn't have time to like, I was driving and I already, it was like the most I've ever invested in any, and it was like the front end of this course. And I'm like, or of this coaching center. And I, I was just like all in, you know, when you like say yes to yourself and you're yep. like fucking go time, like, yep. <laughs> like it's like, yep. this is it. Anyway, <laughs> so I had to go pick up my son from school and like literally buy a certain time. And I always get there with a minute to spare. So uh, yep. I didn't have more than like two minutes to spare. And I'm driving and I was thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, uh, and it was just, I'm like, I don't have to do it. She said, you don't have to. I'm like, oh, she said, you don't have to, but I think there's a trick. Yeah, you gotta do it. She said, do it. I was at a stoplight and I literally, it was like a movie and I looked to my left and I saw the suit shop and I'm like, can I turn it in? And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like sitting there rocking back and forth in the car. Like, oh my God. All right. Oh my God. Oh my God. So I was like, I'm just going to go in. I'm going to turn. And I knew where the counter was. I'm like, go in and turn to the left. Ask it really quick. Walk right out. Okay. All right, let's do it. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So I go in. Worst, worst thing. Go in. No one's at the front. Oh, God. No one's at the back. They're helping customers. And, oh, I'm like, no. and then I start. And then I start pretending to look at suits oh <laughs> my god it was I'm like, worse i'm like sitting there i'm like i'm breaking out in full body hives here i'm like touching the terrible suits and i'm like mm, wow very interesting and i'm like oh god all right maybe i should just leave and i'll do it another time and i was like no i can't i can't i have to do it right now so finally i walk up just read, honestly i have like ptsd just reliving this with you right now <laughs> i start walking up and they're like can we help you look for anything i'm like oh you, <laughs> I was like having an out- <laughs> no, you're nervous. I was having an outer body experience, and I was like, I don't even know how because I don't have a, a, a poker face. Like I really like wear my emotions, but I just kind of like switched off. And I was like, Do you guys have pizza? And they're like, <laughs> they're like, because I I didn't want to be like rowdy or like jokey about it. So I was like dead ass. Like I was like, Do you guys have pizza? And they're like, Oh, like like pizza socks like they were thinking you know dress socks with like crazy <laughs> I was like no like I was talking to them like they were idiots I was like, no. you explain yourself. 
and we're shout i'm shouting like in a few <laughs> yards I wasn't even close. So I, there's multiple people looking at me. <laughs> I was like, no, like pizza. Do you have, do you oh, have no, this is horrifying. Oh, I was, and like my whole, like whole body. And they're like, no, we don't have pizza. And I was like, oh, okay. And I like turned out and walked away. And I was like, I fell on my back, like all like everyone <laughs> disgusting. And like, I got in the car and I was just like in a cold sweat. But it's so, did it. it did it and it's like and part of me was like oh, so dumb but then another part of me is like yeah like what do i care like something that she says that's so beautiful is like um be willing to be a massive disappointment to everyone yeah it's just yeah. like what this these things that we feel like they're very real and like all of our feelings are very valid but also they're not they're just, they're like clouds. Like I'm never, I don't even remember the faces of those people. And it was a horrifying event for me. And I don't even remember what they looked like. And they probably <laughs> wouldn't remember me if I walked in. Maybe they would, I don't know. But <laughs> the whole point is that like these things that we do and like it increases our threshold like yes. Yes. For more. And so yes. even like with other things like shoots, going on a shoot and something like crazy happens. And like, if you don't feel equipped to, it doesn't matter. You're there you're there for it and then yep. next time that like bandwidth's a little bit wider and the same thing with like with life and it only strengthens and bolsters like I can't even oh, oh my god it is it's just that showing up yeah. it's showing up and just having a go and doing it and that's exactly like it expands your bandwidth for receiving and experiencing life and how important all of it is. Yes. Like just all of it. Because it's all connected, whether or not we know in the moment or not. Or yeah. like, I don't even, even think looking back, it's like when you're tuned into the visceral feelings that happen inside you and you don't put any, put every single thing through a filter of logic and... um and I am, hey, I am the guiltiest person of like everything I do. I love to see the 47 layers of purpose behind it and oh, how absolutely. it might like, translate and how it could become this and whatever. But like, I, I think that that is just like the human urge. And I think that that's not the way, like, I think that's just a, a layer of satisfaction, but like, you know, I'm talking about like having a go at writing, writing a book and a couple of years ago, when I didn't even have a, a twinkle of that intention, I bought, I bought a, a, a course from someone on writing, um, yes. just because I loved him. Like yes. I just, he was saying words and I was so like, I love you. And I don't, <laughs> I'm buying this because I just want to listen to you, even though it's not relevant to me. Yes. I guess it yes. is relevant now, you know, like, and I love that. I love that. I love I love that. I just think everyone, you know, like that's another thing. That's another word, thing that's in the book. It's like it is a miracle that we are here. Like the stars aligned, the cycles aligned. People had to meet in, you know, in a certain way. Like for us to get here is an incredible feat. Yeah. You know, like, and then everyone that we come in contact with in our whole life we learning from yeah. like you might not have needed his writing course but you loved him yeah mm -hmm. so he was there for a reason like he's in your and you took that step to like enjoy him and what he offers and receive his enthusiasm and excitement and knowledge and it's so cool it's so cool it's so cool and it's never, it really is never ending, like the web that happens. And it's just so, oh, oh my God. But imagine the joy you've given those people in that men's warehouse. Seriously. They're gonna oh, be they tell everyone. They're going like, to be like, you, this, this woman come in. You should have seen her. And she asked for pizza. Yeah, I was, that's another thing. I wasn't like a teenager. Like, what was no. they They're like, is she like okay? Is she on the drugs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we just thought of like the Christmas party. They'll be like, do you remember that woman? Remember how she came in? <laughs> I think the clutch layer in that was the fact that I was like acting like they were like being incompetent. Like, <laughs> no, no, yes. I mean, pizza. <laughs> oh my gosh so, okay so tell us are you okay on time i'm okay yeah i'm okay 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 um uh can you tell us what you're what you're up to because you have such a beautiful mentoring business and it seems like there's a huge focus around clarity appropriately so <laughs> can you just tell us a little bit about that yeah so when jack was in the hospital. Um, he'd just come back from theatre and so this is after he had his motorbike accident. And he yeah, was unconscious. he they had to fix all these bones and dress all these wounds and it was horrendous. Um and I was just sitting there and I was just like the level of um I suppose clarity that came over me was just like um, I I literally have no choice now but to do the things I love in my life. Like there is no choice. I have lived through the phone call of your child is here unconscious. Mm. We thought he was in bed. We thought he was in bed because we'd had an argument with him the night before. He wanted to go out and we were like, absolutely not. You need to stay home. Um, and he went out and um, got on a motorbike in a pair of shorts, a pair of thongs and a T-shirt, no helmet. And, yeah, then we got the phone call. So sitting next to his bed, I was, yeah, I was literally like, I I have to live consciously from a place of doing things that I love. And at the time I was working full-time at the emergency department, burnt out, thought I was doing the right thing, like, you know, doing shift work so I could be here at certain points for the boys, always making sure that the house was, you know, a home for them that I wanted and I could spend time with Scott. And I was burnt out, like completely burnt out because I thought I was doing the right thing with, you know, trying to do everything all the time. And it's always been very important. Writing photography has always been very important to me. And conversation. Mm-hmm. I think women in conversation, I've been fascinated with. Like I remember sitting at my nana's dining room table with all our aunties and, you know, oh. my nana and, you know, we, she'd give us these tea and little teacups and she was a, you know, she was, a cook, like she was cook. She there was always food and biscuits and cakes and you know I remember sitting as a little tiny girl, barely able to look over the table, just like listening to all these women's conversations. And oh, I love that. They, they, they had a, my nana had a sewing room, and I remember sitting on the floor in this sewing room, just like listening to my aunties and like my cousins, and we'd all be sitting there, and my sisters. And I remember as a little girl loving that. I loved listening to them. And, you know, it's funny because when my nana died and we went back and we had to clean the house out, I went into the sewing room. And as a little girl, that room seemed huge. Mm -hmm. And I went in as a a 39-year-old woman. It was tiny. It was so tiny. But the memories that it brought back were incredible. And, you know, after everything we went through with Jack, and the loneliness that I felt and the despair, I'd lost. So let me back up. When the boys started at Montessori school, there were 70 kids there. So a tiny little school. And a friend of mine, who is my dear, dear friend, I love her there. She is very out there, very, you know, she's like the extrovert. She knows every single person ever. <laughs> and she, she's just... Uh, and so this one morning, it was a Wednesday morning, she said, come for coffee. And there's like a local coffee shop. And I said, oh, okay. Anyway, I got there. And as soon as I walked in, it was like when you walked into that men's warehouse, instant hives, instant nervousness. I'm like, what the fuck? And she was sitting at this table with six other women. And that wasn't me. 
That was not my fault. I thought it was was Sarah and I, and that was it. We're bamboozled. Yep, and she she could see the resting bitch face. Mm -hmm. And she walked over to me and gave me a cuddle and whispered in my ear. She goes, it's fine. And she, like, held my hand and we walked back over to the table and I was just like, oh, you bitch. Anyway. (laughs) That started, that day started Wednesday Coffee. So pretty much from that day on until Tom left the Montessori school five years later, we met for Wednesday coffee. And I didn't, like, the women that were at that table, we didn't see each other outside of that table. We'd see each other at school and go, oh, hey, and that'd be it. We didn't socialise. It was like this little container on a Wednesday and we would just talk. Oh. The conversation, some days, you know, like some days we were just all too busy. We would literally get our coffee, catch up for like half an hour and then go. Other days, God, some days we'd sit there for like three hours and just talk about everything. And when I was going through everything that I was going through with Jack, um, Tom had just left the Montessori school. So I had no need to go to Wednesday Coffee. It was like once your kid kind of left the school, you kind of left the group almost. Um, and there was probably four, there was five of us actually that all left the school at the same time. So we didn't have Wednesday coffee. And we'd never caught up outside of Wednesday coffee. And so. Ever again? No. Oh my gosh, this is so mysterious. Yeah, like we literally haven't seen each other again since that day. And we live in the same area. Like I've never run into them at the grocery store. I haven't, like, I'd yeah. still go to the coffee shop. Yeah. And I've never seen them again. It was like that was our time. That was yeah. our time. And that was over. Wow. And so those conversations were incredible. Like just women's conversations. Like mm-hmm. women's conversations. I just, I will never. Just the depths you can go to, the mm. healing, the wisdom, mm. just what the energy that passes between women when they speak is incredible. And when I was sitting there, I was like, I'm going to dive so deep into motherhood photography. Like people are not going to know what's happened because every mother needs a photo with their kid. Like every mother I know is getting a bloody photo with their kid after this experience. And it was totally from a place of pain, absolute pain, mm-hmm. that I decided to create my business of like motherhood photography. And you know, once I started doing it, I was like, this cannot be my sole income. I will not last. I will burn myself out. Um, and I was like, it's not the only thing that I love. Like, it's just not the only thing that I love. Mm-hmm. my business doesn't just have to be photos mm-hmm. and you know like I let that sit for a while and then April last year I was like um I'm gonna do my I'm doing my own thing and at the time it was VA like virtual assistant and as soon as I put the call out, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a virtual assistant, near hand, you know, blah, blah. Because I'd worked at the hospital as admin for 25 years. So I was like, what do you need? I can help. And I got clients that day, like straight away. And, you know, the universe is such a cool thing. Every woman that came into that those sessions, not one of them came with admin work. They came with conversation of just, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm procrastinating. I don't feel good enough. Um, oh my gosh, you, know, you must read this Deepak book. You have, you yes, bought. I will. I will. <laughs> can, you send, can you send me the um the name? And, you know, just I'm struggling with motherhood. I'm struggling with creativity. I don't believe in myself. I have zero self-worth. I am building a business um, that's burning me out because I don't know what I'm doing. Like every single client came just with conversation wow not not one came and said can you do my email list or can you do my you know whatever 
And then that's when I change the wording around what I offer. Um, Because I'm like, I am of more value in conversation than if I just help you with your email list once. Yeah. Women are so, so incredible when they know themselves, when they know why. Like if they've got if they've got a purpose, they just get it done. They just do. They just do. If they feel seen and heard and acknowledged and even just one conversation, just one conversation can completely change energy and mindset and just someone reflecting back what you're bringing. Mm. And that's been the thing. Like these women come in, we have these conversations and I'm not educating, I'm not teaching, I'm reflecting back to them. Like they say things and I'm like, I ask them the flip question back and I can literally see on some of the faces just like an instant relief or an instant acknowledgement or a, a a weight is just like oh my god like I I didn't think of that or I can't believe that came out of my mouth and you reflected that back because they would have missed it yes like yes. it's like t- here's the answer and they're like put like where's the answer <laughs> like swatting it because away because we do <laughs> we we think we have to pull everything apart yeah mm-hmm. to find it but it's like mm-hmm. you have like you know mm-hmm. you know like you know mm-hmm. you always to, know mm-hmm. to have to have the opportunity to hold space for women like that and have those types of conversations. Some days I just get off the calls in like gratitude tears. Yeah. And just, it's not about me. It's not about, and you know, I think sometimes that's the thing I struggle with mostly in my marketing because I just want to shout out just book a conversation mm-hmm. like they're so and I know like you know in marketing everyone's like it's so impactful and so impactful of course they are but they just they're simple conversations and they're simple questions reflected back but bloody hell they go deep mm. you know it's funny I I for so much of my almost all my life I'm like self-proclaimed lone wolf introvert if I'm in a a class project with you and I'm in a group don't worry your name's on it I'll see you next week like and just (laughs) and you know I and I mean I love I love people but like I also if I am not if I don't feel like a very specific like this I can't do it more than two minutes. I'm like, I'm exhausted. So usually I'm like alone in my, I'm in my little back cave in my basement, like doing my stuff. Um, (laughs) And it wasn't until, um, was it two years now or a year and a half now? I don't know. I got laid off. Um, I was doing, I was actually remote at this point after COVID full-time remote uh, job. And they had laid me off like during, it was two weeks into my second maternity leave. And I was like blindsided, like blindsided, very blindsided. I was still bleeding. And I was just like, you know, I'll never, never again will I let myself, if I'm going to be whiplashed, like I might as well be steering the ship type of thing. Yes. So it was then when I started like going into all these um, containers and it's so funny because all the the programs I was buying into I was like okay community okay mm. <laughs> like, I was like okay whatever I don't care about what's the what are the pdfs where are my videos um, <laughs> like I don't <laughs> and I I'm telling you that like from that very first program I signed up for um 
that I don't even remember most of the material. Like there are two women that I talk to like almost every day of my life, like from there and continuing like now, like every time I'm in a container, I am just in awe of the people I meet. I just realized how, when you, how do I say this? Like, I, you don't need to be with people that are like you to love them. And it's not they're, that they're any less like, like my family, I love them to the ends of the earth, but it's not, it, you, it, you can't just, I don't even, there's no words like for yeah. what happens when you just have a thing and you know that you see each other in a way that no yes. words need to be spoken and you don't need to give someone the whole background of your life in, in order to say this one sentence that you just really need to say. Exactly. It's yeah. so, it's incredibly yeah. powerful. And now I'm like complete opposite. Like I'm still total introvert, but like the value of this one-on-one connection and this, you know, to have a coach, I never want to not have a coach ever. I know. I'm the same. Ever. I'm the same. And I am very much an introvert, but put me, see, I keep getting coached to do group calls, mm-hmm. group offers. At this, and that may come, eventually may come. Mm-hmm. At this stage of where I am, the the power of this one to one, and like you said, you know some of the some of the conversations I have with women, it's literally one sentence. Mm-hmm. They will, I'll be like, you know, what are we talking about this week? Or it's not that, but you know, we'll start the conversation, and it's literally one sentence, and for one hour, we can pull that. Mm-hmm in so many directions, so deep, so just the tangents that can go off just one concept or one sentence or what just and sometimes we literally sit there almost in silence and just let it all just sink in. Shift and and breathe. And that's what I think it is too, is because you're not like what you're saying too. It's like, you're not even like, um, like pulling for the answers and burrowing, whatever. It's like just the space that opens when you reflect something back. Like it could even just be like, oh, like, like what you said, the relief of just like letting air out of something and it just makes space for more. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And and I think too, we forget how connected we are as women. Mm-hmm. And I think we do that lone wolf thing to the depths of our despair. And to be in a container where even one word or one sentence can be reflected back and you feel instantly sick instantly recognized and it's just this unbelievable recognition of self that you didn't know that you needed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like women are incredible once they get to that space of just being able to be that vulnerable and be that honest and it doesn't even have to be deep stuff. It's just like, you know, like we talk, I talk a, a, a huge, huge conversation that continually comes up is comparison. And, you know, we'll explore that. And, you know, like the other day it came out of, you know, one of my clients, she just, it's debilitating for her some days, the comparison. And, you know, it all just came out of just like she literally feels like she's not getting recognized. And I said, I can't, I honestly can't even remember what I said to her. And she texts me later and was like, I've had to go outside because I feel 
I feel like my whole mind has shifted from that one conversation. Mm. She's like, I, I haven't even had to do anything or learn anything or write anything. Like she was just like one, that one sentence that we were talking about. She, she just, she texts me a few times now and she's like, I, I'm almost insecure about how much I feel like I've shifted. <laughs> yeah. Um, Can it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally like, did that really happen? <laughs> she's like, it feels like it should be harder. It feels like I should have done more or I should learn more or I should be, you know, like how could it be that simple that I've come to this realisation from one conversation? Yeah, and you know, it's like that story of if I if I were to let that be gone, is that dishonoring the years yep. torment and struggle yep. or the relationships that have been built out of it or the I recently had this freaking realization and I'm in an NLP certification course right now. We were doing something on uh, beliefs and I was working with fear. It was one of the things that I've gotten from my father is this. And I mean, fear, like life fear, like physical, like worst case scenario, always still ever sit with your back to a door in a restaurant. Like as, as if I'm in like the secret service, like I'm telling you, my, my partner tells me he, I look like a, a field mouse when we're out places, oh God. like seriously. And you know, I look at you going in and asking for pizza then. I know, but no, this is, I'm talking about like physical safety. <laughs> so, so anyway, I just uncovered in, in that one process we did it's like oh I feel like if I let go if I fully let go of fear and I don't let that be my primary thing I it I am in some way um, betraying my father I am not being the uh I'm not being the mother or the uh caretaker or whatever that I can be because fear means love like if you're really debilitatingly afraid then that means um you, you will think of all of the worst case scenarios and you will do everything you can to try to stop that from happening and you will not be happy because you'll always know that if you're too happy then you'll drink something else like it's just like oh my god like oh I think that fear is love I remember in college when I first started dating my partner who's like was brought up very differently and just like so laid back sometimes I want to shake him <laughs> that like one time I left his place and I went back to my dorm and it was at night and I was so offended that he didn't make sure I got home and I was like I could have died I could have been kidnapped and like to me that wasn't love because of what I knew right, but, so it's like yeah. and you know, I'm not going to say that like, I'm as a bird now, but like also <laughs> just saying that to myself, like to me, like up until this point in my life, fear has meant love. Like it just, like it broke open and like, it's like birds flew out. I'm like, oh, like, it's like, I feel tender and like compassion for myself which is weird so sometimes it's really hard for us to feel compassion for ourselves yeah. but like yeah. then I feel like compassion for like just the whole situation and it's just like one point yeah. and and yeah there's that very real like can it be true that like I don't have to be complete like my partner recently has been talking to a company in New Zealand and we're in Ohio right now and I'm like he's like aren't you afraid? And I was like, no, if we, if they give you the job, let's go, you know, like, yeah. Like, am I full of shit right now? Am I just like on the sugar pill? And I'm like, no, why am I questioning <laughs> myself? Like, no, like I just, I'm not. And I don't know, that has to be part of it. And I feel like when you're talking about your client, that's how I feel. I'm like, yeah, just someone needed to, show me that but I knew it 
you know, just like yeah. she knew it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just that awareness. Mm-hmm. I think. Or deeper than awareness. It's just this. Making yeah. it's making the unconscious conscious. Yeah. So that you can go back to like making it unconscious, right? Because it's like, what's the thing? It's like unconscious, unskilled, consciously unskilled, con- consciously skilled, unconsciously skilled, like because that's yeah. mastering. It's, so it's yeah. like yeah. if you can like make the subconscious that's not serving you, <laughs> to put it lightly conscious and just be aware of it and like live with it enough to where that it can be unconscious again but like put back in the way that feels good yes then you can just move oh my gosh yeah oh melinda i could talk to you for bajillion years it's been i know me too oh my gosh (laughs) this has been like i've cried like 47 times (laughs) i i think I don't even remember what it was, but I feel like we had a conversation true to the card that you pulled. <laughs> oh, I totally feel that. There was um, something in there. I can't, I actually can't remember the message fully now, but it was. I just feel like, I, yeah, it, it feels, it feels on point here. Um, can you, uh, I don't know, but uh, one, is there anything else lingering in your mind and heart that you wanted to touch on at all? Anything that's coming up for you? I think we've we've covered a lot. We have covered a lot. Do you want to ask anything else? Mm, no, I don't have anything else right now. Yeah, I feel good. That was an incredible conversation. I feel really, really good. And also very bittersweet. I'm like, no, you're my best friend now. You're, not leaving. you're not leaving. What else can I talk to her about? <laughs> Oh my god, it's 9 45 p.m. And then I'm like, oh, come to New Zealand because that's like two hour flight from here. Oh my gosh, you have no idea. I don't know what it is. I told you in my messages like back then. I don't know what it is. I am like a moth to a flame with anything Australia. I don't even know. It's so crazy. Um, okay, so can you tell us? We're gonna put it on the show notes. Tell us where we can verbally, where we can find you. Yes, so um it's now Mrs. Melinda Edwards on Instagram or just melindaedwards.com for my website. Okay. So we will yeah. put that in the show notes and um and I'll send you um an email about the um yeah bio and I'll give um I'll put a code in there too for my clarity workbook. Oh you have a workbook? Awesome. Yeah. Oh and what yeah. about um where's your book available? On my website. On your website. I'll put, okay. the, I'll put the link there as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you will come back whenever you want to have another conversation. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll just talk to you every week. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to stop recording here. If you enjoyed this episode and want to get in on actual conversations with me, join the Help Me See podcast private Facebook group. Every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, I'll be hopping on live for Q&A on the latest episode and for free consulting if you need a bit of help thinking about ways to save your memories. Did you get something out of this episode? I really, really, really hope you did. And I would love to hear from you. I'm on a mission to empower you to feel peace knowing that you are not missing your life. One of the best ways that you can support me is leaving a review. And honestly, I'd rather hear about the memory you saved because of this podcast rather than any kind of accolade. Tell me how this podcast has impacted you. And one, I'll probably cry. (laughs) And two, I'd love to give you a shout out on the show. Take a minute and head out to the link in the bio to write a review now on the podcast.